It's just fun to me to be in a church that has a vision for reaching people, for making disciple makers, and that's what you, you guys are. And I'm from Georgia. I, I was born in a little town called Waynesboro, Georgia, if any of you have ever heard of that. It's east of here, and moved to Atlanta when I was in the third grade and stayed there until I graduated, and that was a long, long, long time ago, okay? I think Atlanta had about a million people when we when I moved, went off to college, and I don't know what you guys have got now, this greater metro area. I know you've got a lot of traffic, okay? Just seems like it doesn't matter what time I go through Atlanta, there's always traffic. I am, though, an avid, and always have been, an avid Georgia Bulldogs fan, okay? And you tech people, God bless you. Uh, maybe in your next life you'll be better off, okay? But if you're a bulldog or if you're a dog fan, man, I'm with you all the way. But Pastor Eric, thank you for letting me uh, return. I want to brag on you guys for a second. Last year, I put the challenge out. Let's start some churches in parts of the world where there aren't any. And several of you started giving. And people from your church here in the past year have given enough, have funded enough money to plant, we've been able to plant over 100 brand new churches in villages where there are no churches. Now our churches are small, but even as small as they are, over 100 churches would be over 2,000 people. Eric, about how many chairs are set up here? A couple of hundred? Yeah, 200. So think about putting somebody in every one of these chairs and doing it again and 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 again. And that's how many new believers have come into the kingdom and not just pray to prayer, but actually been connected to a church family where they're being taught to in turn reproduce and multiply. And that's what you guys have accomplished in the past year. Now there can't be a whole lot of churches in coming Georgia that planted 100 churches in the last year. Maybe there are some. I can't imagine there's a lot. Each of those churches also take care of an orphan or a widow. And so there's like 100 orphans, widows being cared for today. And that again is a result of your work. And I just want to thank you. Can we, yeah, that's a big hand. And, and what's really significant is most of these churches, if not all of them, have been in villages where there are no churches. Because, see, we work among, primarily among unreached people groups, UPGs, they're called. I was trying to explain this in Brother Stan's class in the last hour, but let me uh, try to explain it here. If you let this worship center, this uh, auditorium here, represent a people group, an ethnicity, um, then, and let's let every chair represent a village, all right? So maybe uh, you guys are on the front row. Uh, uh, sir, on the end there, let's let your village be uh, a thousand people, and yours be 500 people, and yours be 300 people, and Eric, your village is, we'll say, 2,000 people, and you, your village, a thousand people. Uh, can you guys stand up for just a second, you two? And sir, can you? And can you guys stand? If this is an unreached, if you guys represented an unreached people group, there would be churches in these two villages and this one in these two. And the rest of you, there is no Christian presence. You've never heard about Jesus. You're not rejecting him. You don't know who he is. And the reason you don't know who he is is nobody's ever told you. Now maybe a few villages around where you guys are, maybe, maybe you've got the, the, the gospel out to them. But the rest of them, no. Thank you. You may be seated. See the slide here? It's a little hard to see up here. But we've been surveying, we've been surveying villages all over the world. And where you see green villages, we found Christians and churches there. Where you find yellow, we found Christians, no churches. Red means we could not find a single uh, church, a single Christian. And what we did with your funding is we painted about a hundred of those red and yellow villages green. We went to churches, or villages where there were no churches. In other words, we didn't go to these two villages because we already had churches there. We went to those. We've been painting red and yellow villages green, and we've been able to paint about a hundred of them, a little over a hundred, 
in the last year as a result of your giving and your prayers. And I'm here primarily today just to say thank you. I thank God for what you've done. And again, with those villages have come orphans. Every one of these villages have an orphan or a widow, and they've been being taken care of also. Now, the big thing that we need today is prayer. And I stressed this in the class I was just in. I'm going to be standing right over by the little black communion table there when the service is over. And if you'd be willing to pray, if you just come get a card, it'll take about 15 seconds to fill it out, and you've got to leave it with me. And what I'll do is about once a month, I'll send you some prayer requests. Some of you signed up for the prayer team last year when I was here. You're already getting these. And thank you for your prayer. And we'll send you prayer requests about once a month. And all we ask is that you pray and then delete the email. Don't ever post it on social media. Just pray and delete, pray and delete. That's all you've got to do. And I cannot tell you how important this is. There are there are so many uh, needs right now. We're training a third of a million church planters and disciple makers in 30-something different countries. We're in the five largest Muslim countries in the world. I want to tell you something. When you go into a, vi a Muslim village where there's never been a church, and you start lifting up the name Jesus and preaching Jesus, all kinds of things happen. Most of them are not real good, okay? And I can say the same thing about a Hindu village or a Buddhist village or an animist village, the same thing. And if there's anything we need, it's prayer. There are many problems, great persecution, incredible poverty. The pandemic has messed everything up. Most countries have been hit like we have, but they don't have the infrastructure they don't have the vaccinations. They don't have anything. And so you say, what do they do? They die. And we lost in one country this past year 30 of our Pauls, 30 of our trainers from COVID in just one country in about a one-month period. Okay? They just died. There's, there's no help for them. And so we need your prayer. I'm one of your missionaries. Uh, missionaries need funding. I haven't figured out how to do ministry without money. Everything costs money. But more than we need the funding today, we need the prayer. If you'll see me right over here afterwards, we'll get you signed up. If you have children in your home, please, especially you, we want your children praying. And you as uh, students, man, I want every, if you've got an email address, we want you to sign up. We want you to pray. Well, uh, today I want to talk to you about, I want to ask you a question, can God use you? And I probably need to change the message of this the title of this sermon because everybody, if you've been around church at all in your life, you know God can use you, right? Well, this is a question. I think we know it in our heads. We know in our heads that God can use us. But today I want it to move from your head. I want it to move down to your heart. I want you leaving here today convinced that God not only can use you, but God wants to use you. Let me share with you a few verses. John 15 and verse 16. John 15 and verse 16. Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Let me just stop right there. I'm not sure that he said it quite this way, but every time I read this verse, what I get in my mind is Jesus saying, like he's talking to a group of people like this, and he says, wait a minute, hold on a second. Let's get something straight. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And I chose you for a reason. I chose you and I have appointed you to go and bear remaining fruit. Well, what is the fruit of a Christian? The fruit of a Christian is another Christian. He's saying, I want you to reproduce. Uh, crickets produce crickets. Crows produce crows. Christ followers produce Christ followers. All you've got to do is read the first page of the Bible and you learn that everything reproduces after its own kind. Christians reproduce Christians. That's, that's your fruit. Jesus is saying, I chose you. I've given you an appointment. Your appointment is to go and bear fruit. Well, look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus basically said the same thing. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Look at that verse very closely. No matter what version you read it in, you'll not find the word please. It's not a request. He's not asking us. He said, I chose you for a reason. I've given you an appointment. Your appointment is to reproduce, to bear fruit. I've given you a commission, a great commission, 
to go and make disciples, Christ followers of all nations. And then, not only did he say, I've chosen you to be my fruit bearers and my disciple makers, he said, I've chosen you to be my ambassadors. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 20. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. And by the way, that church had some issues. They were not a perfect church. And Paul looks at those guys, and here's what he says to them. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Look at the verse again. Paul did not say, I am an ambassador. He said to that church, we are ambassadors. The, the biggest problem, I think, in the American church today, and I work in churches all over the world, and they all have their issues, but I think the biggest problem is the average church in America does not see him or herself as an ambassador. We see ourselves as embassy workers. This church is like the embassy, and it takes a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff that somebody's got to run the, the, mic, the sound. Somebody's got to run the PowerPoint. Somebody's got to lead in worship. Somebody's got to make that delicious coffee out there. Somebody's got to do all the, somebody had to set up the chairs this morning. They do, chairs don't just set up by themselves. Somebody has to do all of that. But we tend to see our primary ministry is inside the walls of this church, inside the embassy. When the word of God says, no, 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 you're more than embassy workers. Somebody needs to set up the chairs, but, but you're supposed to be doing more than that. Somebody's got to preach a sermon, but there's, there's, there's something higher than that I have for you. He says, you are ambassadors. Do you know what an ambassador does? An ambassador is sent from another country into a foreign land to deliver the messages for the king that sent him or her. That's what we do. And what is the message? That people can be reconciled to God. That they can be brought back into a right and righteous relationship with God. Look at it again. Paul didn't say, I'm the ambassador, you're the embassy worker. That's not what he said. He said, we are ambassadors. You say, but David, I've not been sent from a foreign country. I, I, Stan, I think you're in here somewhere. Stan said he was born 13 miles from here, I think. I think that's what he said. He's a, a native here. Uh, you say, I, I was born and raised here. Well, look at the next verse, uh, Philippians 3.20. Actually, the Bible says our citizenship is not in the United States. It's in heaven. This world's not your home. God has put you here to represent him as his ambassador, to go and bear fruit, to reproduce, to make disciples. That's your identity. That's who you are in Jesus Christ. You're one of his, you're one of his fruit bearing, disciple making ambassadors. This is not your home. Now I, I grew up in Georgia, but I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, uh, UNC. Uh, beat those uh, devilish Duke players last night. And I live about 15 minutes from both those schools, okay? And uh, so I live in Raleigh, and a few months ago, we were driving through the city, and I got to thinking, I said to my wife, Loretta, I said, darling, I'm having a hard time figuring out where I want to be buried. And she said, what do you think I'm talking about being buried for? And I said, well, I'm 68. And I know that shocks you people. You thought I was like 45, didn't you? I said, I'm 68. And I said, we need to be talking about because men typically die about seven years sooner than women. And by the way, men, why is that? Have you ever asked yourself why? I have a theory. I think our wives put stuff in our coffee when we're not watching. Okay, that's my theory. But anyway, statistically, she's going to be a widow. And she's going to have to bury me. And so I was saying, you know, where do I, I thought, I can't figure out where I want to be buried. She said, well, don't, don't you want to be buried here in Raleigh? I said, no, a bunch of Tar Heels. I don't want to be buried in North Carolina. And she said, what about Georgia? You're from Georgia? I said, no, a bunch of red clay. Uh, I don't want to be buried in Georgia. And she, well, she's from Indiana. She said, what about Indiana? I said, buried with a bunch of Hoosiers. 
I said, I don't even know what a Hoosier is. I was in Indianapolis last week. I asked several people, what's a Hoosier? They all said the same thing. We don't know. There are theories, but we don't. The Hoosiers don't even know what a Hoosier. What is a Hoosier? It's like asking, what is a woman today? Nobody can seem to give you an answer. What is a woman? What is a Hoosier? They don't know what a Hoosier is. And we started our ministry in California. She said, what about, I said, that's the last place I want to be buried. Look, I, what am I trying to say? I don't feel like I got a home. This world is not my home. I'm just what? Passing through. You're looking at an ambassador. I'm here for a reason. To tell this world, world, you can be reconciled to God. But according to the scriptures, not only are you looking at an ambassador, but I'm looking at a bunch of them. That's who you are. That's not all you are. Acts 1 verse 8 says that we're his witnesses. The very last statement Jesus said before he went back to heaven, he said, he said, I'm going home, but the Holy Spirit, I'm going up, the Holy Spirit's coming down, and the Holy Spirit is going to come and live inside of you, and he's going to give you power, and you might be my witnesses. Is that what it says? You ought to be my witnesses. Is that what it says? It says you will be. You see, everyone in this room that's a Christ follower, you are a witness for Jesus. The only question is what kind of witness are you? Are you a faithful one or are you an unfaithful one? He said you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's like saying coming and in all Judea. What is this, Forsyth County? Uh, uh, for, that's like saying for, and Samaria. Samaria would be close by but a different culture. The whole world has moved to this greater Atlanta area. And finally he said to the ends of the earth, and that's where people like me come in. We help you guys make disciples ends of the earth. But Jesus said here, the Holy Spirit's going to come. Question, look at me church. How many of you have the Holy Spirit living inside? Out of you. Let me see your hands. Actually, this is Georgia. Can we say amen? amen? Yeah, Holy Spirit lives inside. Now, how many Holy Spirits are there? Are there like 17 Holy Spirits? How many Holy Spirit? There's one Holy Spirit. You got the same Holy Spirit living in you that Jesus talked about here. You got the same Holy Spirit living in you that lived in Peter and Paul and James and John. There's not two Holy Spirits, there's one, and he's not old, and he's not sick, and he's not weak, and listen to me, he is not intimidated by your city. The Holy Spirit, Almighty God himself lives inside of you, and he has come to live inside of you for a purpose, to give you the power and the authority you need to be an effective witness for him. What does a witness do? A witness tells what they've seen what they've heard, what they know to be the truth. Jesus is saying, I have come and done the work my Father sent me to do. It is finished. I shed every drop of blood, that blood we just sang about a moment ago. I've shed all the blood that needs to be shed for the world to have their sins forgiven. I'm now going home, but as I go, the Spirit's coming down, and he's going to come and live inside of you, and he's going to give you the power that you need to be effective witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Let me sum this up. Jesus says, I chose you. I didn't just choose you to give you a, 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 a free ticket out of hell and a free ride to heaven. He said, I chose you for a greater reason than that. I chose you. I gave you an appointment. Your appointment is to reproduce, to bear fruit. You are my disciple makers. You teach others how to live like Jesus and then lead others to do the same. You are my ambassadors. You represent me in a foreign world. You are my witnesses. And everything you need to be an effective witness, I've given you the Holy Spirit. That's who we are. But, there's always a but. There's always a problem. We got an enemy. And this enemy wants to convince us that God can't use us, especially in the area of making disciples especially in the area of evangelism and seeing people uh, reproducing uh, believers. We have an enemy, the devil, and he'll say to you, he'll say, God can't use you. He'll say, he, God can't use you because you're not smart enough. He'll say, God can't use you because you've not been trained well enough. He'll tell you, God can't use you because you're not gifted enough. He'll tell you, God can't use you because you're not good enough. He'll remind you of your past. 
Some of you have done some pretty rough stuff. And Satan will never let you forget it. Kind of like your mother-in-law. She'll never let you forget it. Okay? Satan will never let you forget that. The stuff you've done. Some of you are sitting there right now and you're thinking, well, yeah, I know the Bible says God shows me. I know I'm an, it says I'm an ambassador, but, but David, you don't know my past. You don't know how many years I spent in jail. You don't know how, much, uh, how many times I've been drunk. You don't know how many times I've, I've let stuff come out of my mouth that I had no business saying. Satan will remind you that you're not good enough. Well, there's a verse, John 8, 44. Jesus made this statement, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Jesus basically said, when your enemy the devil opens his mouth, he's lying to you. I didn't say it. Jesus said he is a liar. Years ago, I heard somebody say, when Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. And his future is not very good. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything, in, if there's any voice in your mind today saying to you that you cannot be a disciple maker, you haven't got the training, you haven't got the charisma, you don't have the, the smarts, you've never been to seminary, you don't, uh, you're too shy. If, 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 that, if you're hearing a, hearing a voice like that right now, that voice is not coming from the Holy Spirit. That voice is coming, those words are coming from your enemy, the devil, who wants to keep you from the appointment that Jesus saved you to keep. That voice is coming from your enemy, and Jesus said your enemy is a liar. You know, when you look at the Bible, everybody Jesus used were severely flawed people. Almost everybody, if not everybody. Ever heard of a guy named Noah? Remember Noah and the big ark? Have you been up to Kentucky to see the ark? Noah's the, the big flood? God used Noah to save the entire human race. Everyone in this room can trace their lineage back to Noah. Every one of us. Well, the first thing Noah did when he got off that big boat, the very first thing he did, this is what I would have expected of a great spiritual giant like Noah. The first thing he did was he made an altar and worshiped God. Good for you, Noah. You know what the second thing is he did? He got drunk. Noah got drunk. And that drunkenness led to a problem with one of his sons and, and the, the whole human race just started going downhill. I mean, no, no sooner were we out of the boat and on dry ground than we started going downhill again just that quickly. God used a drunk to save the human race. If God can use Noah, can God use you? Ever heard of a guy named Jacob? Jacob lied to his father. His father was on what he thought was his deathbed. He was sick as he could be, old man dying. He was blind, couldn't see. Jacob walks up to his dying, blind father, lies to his face, and steals his brother's birthright, his brother's inheritance. I mean, that's pretty low. I doubt if anyone in this room has gone to your dad on their deathbed, lied to the dad, and stolen your brother's <coughs> inheritance. That's pretty low. Jacob did that. You said, could God use a man like Jacob? He later changed his name to Israel. Oh, yes, God used Jacob. You ever heard of a guy named Moses? Stood face to face with Pharaoh, eyeball to eyeball, let my people go. He, brought, he threw his staff down, it became a snake, ate up all the other snakes. He brought all the plagues upon Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, went up on Mount Sinai, spent 40 days and nights plus with Almighty God and gave us the Ten Commandments. One of those Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt not kill. Guess what? Moses murdered a man. Cold-blooded murder. The guy that God used to give us the Ten Commandments to say, Thou shalt not kill, killed a man. Now look, my guess is there's not a whole lot, there's not more than four or five murderers in this room, okay? My guess is there's not that many of you in this room. If God can take a murderer named Moses, and, and by the way, after Moses murdered that man, the Bible says Moses came down from meeting with God and his face just radiated with the glory. He had to put a veil over his face. People were afraid to talk to him because he had been so close to God. 
a man that murdered another man. If God can use a murderer like Moses, can God use you? Can he? You ever heard of a guy named Samson? I don't even know where to start with Samson. Samson, the best way I can describe Samson is he had hormone problems, okay? He just, he, he, Samson never saw a pretty face he didn't fall in love with. He'd do anything for a kiss on the cheek. Uh, Samson uh, was pretty immoral. He was just immoral as, with, with a capital I. But let me tell you something, in his death, not only did he become a great judge in Israel, but in his death he, he took out twice as many of the enemies of God as he had taken out in his entire life. There's probably someone in this room that's been pretty immoral. You've got an immoral past. You'd be pretty ashamed of it if others knew. You can't be any worse than Samson. And God, Samson was one of the great heroes of the faith. Ever heard of a guy named David? David, the shepherd boy? Uh, Killed a bear, killed a lion, killed Goliath, the giant. Uh, the ladies in that day sang about David. They said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. He became uh, the great king of Israel, defeated the Philistines, defeated the, just, just every just nation after nation. He, he became he, 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 just this great warrior, poet. He wrote half the book of Psalms. My guess is if we ask, what's your favorite book in the Bible? About half of you in this room would say the book of Psalms. There's a real good chance David wrote your favorite psalm. He was a poet. He played, he played uh, the, 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 board, the keyboard, the, the harp. He, he was an incredible person. One day he's on his rooftop and he sees a lady taking a bath. And he, he brings her into his palace and has a relationship with her. You know the story, David and Bathsheba. What you may not know is Bathsheba was not only a married woman but she was married to a guy that was a member of what was called David's Mighty Men. David had an army of over a million people. About 50 of them were like our Navy SEALs. They were the elite of the elite. They were called David's Mighty Men. Bathsheba's husband was Uriah the Hittite, one of David's... Listen, this, was, this would be like a cross between a presidential bodyguard and a special ops warrior. While David is sleeping with Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband is on the battlefield fighting David's battles. And when David found out he got Uriah's wife pregnant, he had Uriah put to death. He not only slept with his good friend's wife, he murdered that friend. I doubt if anyone in this room has ever stooped that low. You say, did God use David after that? You flip to the very first page of the New Testament, the very first page, the first chapter, the first verse of the New Testament says these words, Jesus Christ, the son of David. If God can use an adulterous murderer like David, can God use you? You ever heard of a guy named Jonah? Jonah had all kinds of problems. God said, go that way. Jonah said, forget it, God, I'm going that way. God said, okay. And so God sent this big fish. And they threw Jonah overboard, and the fish swallowed Jonah. He lay in the belly of that fish for about three days. And that'll get you right with God. And so after three days, the fish, Jonah said, I'm sorry, God. And the fish spit Jonah. And Jonah came out of that fish running. He hit the ground running. And he ran all the way to Nineveh, and he gave the message that God had told him to give in the first place, which was basically turn or burn. Either repent of your sins or God's going to judge you. And you know what? The whole city listened. It, it was maybe the greatest turning to God in the history of mankind. Everybody repented. The king repented all the way down to the, the guy that, that, uh, that tossed straw in the stable. Everybody repented. It even, it, the Bible even says the animals were dressed in sackcloth. And you say, what is that? It was, a, it was a coarse, rough clothing that people wore in that day when they were grieving and when they were repenting of their sins. It was a way of showing, I've asked God for forgiveness. I'm repented. Even the animals 
were dressed in. You say, how can, that, that'd be like you going home today and when you walk through your front door, your, your, your two dogs are sitting there and they're dressed in sackcloth. They've been repenting while you've been at church. You say, David, how is that even possible? I don't have any idea. But ask Eric, he's your pastor, amen? He can tell you. I have no idea. All I know is that's what it says. The whole city repented, 120 thousand people. Can you imagine if Pastor Eric stood up and preached today and 120,000 people got saved? You would think it was the greatest day in the history of, of, of our church. You know how Jonah responded? You'll find him outside the city on a hillside looking down at the city and when he saw that God decided to spare the people, Jonah got so mad he said, kill me God. I'd rather die than see those people live. What kind of prophet is that? Man, he needs a new job, amen? He needs to get a new job. What kind of prophet? You would think Jonah would be jumping for joy. God, his heart was so hard. Maybe your heart is hard. Maybe you disobeyed God. God said, go this way, and you went that way. And you're thinking, I made a wrong turn and it's too late now and the best I can do now is come to church, maybe pass out a bulletin and work in the nursery once a month. That's about all I can do. No, listen to me. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Why do you think all these stories are in the Bible? Why is it that story after story after story after story after story after story after story, they all have the same thing? A messed up, wrecked, a uh, human being who blew it as bad as you could blew it, somehow God was able to use those people. Can God use you? What about James and John? Jesus called them sons of thunder. That was not a compliment. He wasn't bragging on them. He, it was like an insult. They, they, you say, why do you call them that? Because they were loud and boisterous and angry and, 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 and somebody standing there and they get in an argument. So they say, Lord, can we call fire down from heaven and burn that guy? Who's, who even thinks that way? I mean, when's the last time you bumped into somebody at Walmart and you, you said, Lord, I want to call down fire on the... I mean, nobody does that. James and John did it. You say, can, did God use those guys? James became the first martyr. John, have you ever seen that picture of the Last Supper? We just had communion, the very first communion, Last Supper, where the guy that's leaning over on Jesus, that was John. Do you remember at the cross? Jesus looks down from the cross. He sees his mother, and he looks at his mother and says, Mom, you go home with John. And John, that's my mother. She's special. You take care of her, John. You take care of her. The son of thunder became the apostle of love who wrote John 3.16, who wrote the gospel of John in 1 John and 2 John and 3 John and the last book in your Bible, Revelation. God took a son of thunder and made him an apostle of love. If God can do that with John, can God use you? What about Peter? Ever been to the Garden of Gethsemane, anybody? Oh my goodness, it's holy ground. They say those olive trees there, those things can live 2,000 years. Some of them were probably there when Jesus knelt in that place. It's holy ground. There Jesus is burdened, the Hebrew says he's crying out loud cries of agony. The sins of the world are about to be laid upon him. Your sins, my sins are about to be laid upon him and he's holy. And nothing could possibly bother him worse than that. So he goes to Peter and a couple of the others and say, will you guys pray for me? I can't think of any other time in the Bible Jesus did that. He said, would you pray for me? I need you to pray with me. They said, sure, Lord, we'll pray. And five minutes later, they're snoozing away. And they, he woke them up and they did it again and then they did it again. And after they arrested Jesus, Peter's out by the crowd there warming himself by the fire and some little gal walks up to him and says, you're one of his disciples. And Peter starts cussing like a sailor and Peter says, I've never, I don't know who he is. I don't know them. Have you ever denied Christ? Peter denied him three times that one night. I've denied him. Oh, there have been times I was ashamed of Jesus Christ. God forgive me. 
Can God use a lying, cussing denier? Just a couple of weeks later, Peter stands up filled with the Spirit, preaches, and 3,000 people come running into the kingdom. And the very first church on the day of Pentecost is formed. If God can take somebody who has denied him repeatedly, who cusses and lies, and use him to start the very first church, if God can use Peter, can God use you? I can do this all day. It's a good thing for you folks. I'm getting hungry. Okay? Can God, what about Paul? Paul killed Christians. I mean, his job was putting, finding, sniffing out Christians, finding them, putting them in prison, and basically torturing them until they uh, turned back from Christ. God used them to write half your New Testament, all the, most of the epistles. You, see, Dave, you say, David, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, God used them all. If God can use them, can God use you too? Let me wrap this thing up. I think one of the great blessings of my life doing what I do, <clears throat> I get to work with giants of the faith. I get to meet pastors like Pastor Eric that just about the time I think our nation's doomed and we're in trouble, I meet somebody like him. And I think there's hope. There's hope. And I get to meet the same kind of people worldwide. People that you would think there's no way God could use them, but he's using them greatly. I'm thinking of a guy with no legs. Guy with no legs. He has no legs. Uh, one of our Timothys, he got trained. His church isn't that big, probably about a room seats about 100 people, but it's packed. He has no legs. He just stands out on the street corner on his stubs there and with a big Bible and people come by that they think he's a beggar. Most of them don't want to make eye contact, but those that do, he starts talking to them about Jesus. He leads them to Christ. He's led over 100 people to Christ. He has no legs. How many of you people have legs? Come on, do you have legs? Amen. If God can use a man with no legs, can God use you? What about... Uh, the gal from Asia that can't, she can't read and write. She's a Dalit. You know what a Dalit is? A Dalit's like the lowest class. Sometimes they're called untouchables. There are restaurants where if that lady walks into the restaurant, they're going to kick her out. They're going to say, you can't come in here. And if she touches the plate, they're going to wash it. They're going to say, we can't, we can't use that. She can't read. She can't write. She became a Timothy. In the first four months during that DMD book, Eric, she led, I think it was 84 people to Jesus Christ. She can't even read and write. Everybody in this room can read and write, unless you're from maybe Tennessee, amen? Uh, no offense here. Everybody in this room, everybody in this room, or maybe Cobb County, everybody in this room can read and write. She can't let 84 people the Lord in four months. Imagine what she could do if she was as smart as we are, amen? If God can use her, can God use you? Look at the next picture. These are a bunch of blind widows in East Africa. They're blind. They live out in the middle of the bush. Timothy started a church. They all got saved. Most of them were Muslims. They all got saved. You know what they do now? They hold each other's hand, these blind widows, and they walk through the bush from one village to another, and when they get there, they can't see a thing, but they, they ask, can, uh, can you take us to the widows? And there's always widows there, and these blind widows lead other widows to Jesus Christ. We've started church after church after church through the converts that they've led to Christ. A bunch of blind widows. If God can use blind widows, can God use you? Look at the next picture. Uh, the guy's name's not Dan. Somebody in my office named him Dan. I don't know what his name is, but we just called him Dan the Bible Thief. He robbed a house one day and, and he took everything that looked valuable. He saw this book, so he put the book in his bag and he got to reading the book that night. He couldn't put it down. Turns out it was a Bible. He'd never seen a Bible. Where we work, a lot of people have never seen a Bible. Well, he was introduced to Jesus. He couldn't put the Bible down. He, he read it. He started reading about Jesus and he became a follower of Christ. And after he read the whole Bible, he put it back in the bag, went back to the house, knocked on the door, said, I'm the, guy, I'm the thief. My name is not Dan, but I'm the thief and I stole this stuff, here's it back, 
And I, this, book, this book has changed my life. It told me about a man named Jesus. I've become his follower. That was a, a new family, new believers that had just been reached by a Timothy there. They brought, they brought him into their home. They gave him a bed. They gave him a place at the table. They began to disciple him. Dan became a Timothy and ended up starting a church in the very house he had robbed the Bible from. Now, none of you have ever robbed a Bible unless maybe it was from a, a Hampton Inn or something. Okay, but if God can use a Bible thief, can God use you? Oh, I got a lot of these stories. Look at the next one. I love this guy. He's from the Dasanach tribe up along the Ethiopian border. See his little village in the background there? That's the kind of place he's lived all of his life. His name is John. John can't read. John can't write. John had never seen a movie. They don't have theaters there. One night, some of our guys showed the Jesus film there, and John got so mad at the Roman soldiers for crucifying Jesus. He'd never heard of Jesus, but Jesus seemed to be, I mean, Jesus took care of little children, and he took care of widows, and he fed the hungry, and he healed the sick, and, and everything about Jesus was good. And so here are these Roman soldiers nailing them to a cross. So John picked up rocks and started throwing at the screen. He's trying to hit the Roman soldiers. And then he walked behind the screen and realized it was just an image that night, John gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He became a Timothy. It was four years ago. I checked the records the other day. From that man's ministry, over one, you're not going to believe this, over 100 churches have been started. The majority of them second, third, fourth generation churches. From a guy that has never seen a movie and can't read or write. If God can use Dasanach, John, can God use you? My time's up. I want to close with a verse, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Most guys start with the scripture. I'm going to end with it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, that's the Holy Spirit, to him be glory in the church, that's you, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Can God use you far more abundantly than you could ever ask? or even think. I could tell you my own story. Growing up in Georgia, when I was two, three years old, I just stopped talking. I didn't talk for over a year. You say, why'd you stop talking? I don't know. I just stopped talking. I couldn't walk. I used to have to wear these corrective boots. I hated those things. All the kids made fun of them. To this day, literally, as I'm walking up the steps, I'm praying I don't trip. I'll be praying again as I walk down in just a moment. I mean, if I can walk across the floor without tripping, it's like, it's a home run for me. I can't walk, I can't talk. I got all kinds of issues. Last time I checked, we'd started over 120,000 churches. If God can use a guy that can't walk and a guy that can't talk and a guy that's, you don't even wanna know what my IQ is, if, a guy, if God can use a guy like me, listen to me. Everybody in this room, God can use you. The problem's not him. You'll never guess who the problem is. Now, there's maybe five of you in this room that really believe what I'm telling you. The rest of us, we're going to go home. We're going to get something to eat. We're going to watch some TV. We're going to do our stuff. Maybe there's five of you that really believe this. What's the next step for you? Look at the last slide. Join the prayer team. I'm going to be at that black table over there. Come see me. But don't just pray for TTI. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your elders. Pray for your country. Pray for our leaders. This world is about to blow up. Somebody ought to come to this church property every day and just walk around it seven times like, like Joshua walking around Jericho and just pray. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray for, for your 
Uh, pray for your neighbors. Pray. That's where it, it all starts with prayer. Pray. Will you pray? Are you willing to pray? And if you can't think of anything else to pray about, I'll send you an email every month. I'll give you lots of stuff to pray about. Just pray. If, you're, if, if you say, I want God to use me, where do I start? You start with prayer. Everybody in this room can do that. Number two, invest your money generously. You've got a church here. You've got baskets all over the building. Man, they're not there for decorations. You're supposed to put stuff in them. Invest in your church. You've got a church that's got a vision. You guys, are this, your leaders here are wanting, to, are wanting to reach this whole area for Christ. Support your church. Get behind it. And you guys have been very, I know you've paid off your debt. You've, you've done a great job. Keep letting God use you. In our case on this card, if you want to plant a church, you can plant a church for about a dollar a day. About a dollar a day will plant a church. Everybody can do that. See, invest your money generously. You guys, you guys could start 100 churches every year. You could send tens of thousands of people to heaven if you wanted to. And finally, make disciples here. Mission begins right here. Before Jesus said, into the earth, he said, Jerusalem. It starts right here. Everyone in this room has been appointed to be a disciple maker. That's why Jesus chose you. You say, David, I don't know how. You've got a pastor who's opened two training centers. He'd probably open a third one if he needed to. You've got a pastor who's willing to train you. That's not an excuse. You say, I'm, too bu I'm busy. If you're too busy to do what Jesus saved you to do, you're too busy. You say, David, where do I start? I suggest you start with your children. If you don't disciple them, nobody else is going to. And let me tell you something. It's a bad world out there for your kids to grow up in and not be close to Jesus Christ. So where do you get started? Prayer. Give. Make disciples. Can God use you? It's your choice.